Greetings, Sim Captains, and welcome to this second episode of the Flight Brothers FT podcast. This is recorded on May 26, 2020. In this episode, we're going to be checking out the newly released Air Hauler 2 for X Plane 11, as well as the uh, SSG 7478 freighter version, the Torque Sim SR22, and the Fly J Sim support changes. And it looks like we might even make it back to Torque Sim for an. Uh, Islander update. Uh, Lee, do you want to tell us what we did in our previous podcast, if you recall? Yeah, other than mess around and act like fools, we talked about the Just Flight Vulcan video that uh, we did, thanks to Just Flight and the FSElite.net team over there. So if you haven't watched that video or subscribed, go over to FSElite.net or their YouTube channel. And also, that same week, actually, I think the day before we recorded that, uh, the Torque Sim Islander released, and I believe John Fly did a video about that one. And for everything, as we go through this podcast, guys, we're going to try, or I will try my best to link anything relevant um, in the same order that you hear it. So everything up front, uh, the first video is probably going to be that uh, YouTube video that we have on FS Elite, and we'll just kind of roll through it. So if you have any um desire to go follow up take a look at what we're talking about we'll have those in the video description all right so it looks like the first thing we're checking out today is air hauler 2 and this is kind of lee's project because uh before we got into youtubing we did a ver we were part of a virtual airline and mm -hmm. um that kind of really gamified the sim experience which is something i had not experienced and lee had already been doing what was the one from uh, flight sim called I had flight sim passengers. I think it was 2004. Right. right. And I was at your house. I remember you playing it. And yeah. I remember you uh, making your passengers cranky and losing money. And I, I know you were mm -hmm. super into that. And yeah. I actually think you held off on getting X-Plane a little longer because sure. you knew they didn't have it. So air hauler, right. what, what do you think? Is that going to, you think that's going to uh, fill that hole for you? I don't know. I did go buy it. Uh, it's a Just Flight product. was released uh, just a couple of days ago, as a matter of fact. I think Friday. We're recording this now on uh, Tuesday. So I have purchased it. It's downloaded. It's installed, which was very easy. Unfortunately, that's where the knowledge stops. Um, I haven't launched it yet, and I really haven't played it because I've been waiting for the right time. I want to hit record, and I want to go through it and just kind of capture that on video. So an un unboxing, basically. You're just going to take us along yeah. for the ride. Yeah, basically, because I, I've never used... Um, yeah, obviously, this is the second air hauler, and it's available or has been available for uh, P3D and uh, was it FSX, I think, possibly. Anyway, it, Air Hauler 2 is new to X-Plane. That's what the, the release is. So Ah, got it. I, I, I'm hoping it's very similar to um, how Flight Sim Passengers works. Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, it puts you in control of your own uh, freight and passenger company. This is their words. I kind of copied and paste from the release. Uh, are you um, talking about F uh, flights and passenger or the new air hauler now? Well, for air hauler, sorry. Okay. Yeah, let, let me be clear on that. So um, it basically does the same thing that FS Passengers was. You start a an airline. In FS Passengers, you had to purchase aircraft which were in your folder I'm hoping Air Hauler replicates that. So a 747, for example, was like $240 million. Um, okay, so you would add it to your Air Hauler fleet by yes, buying things that are in your X-Plane hangar, and they would all have set values of some sort? Okay. Yeah, correct. Well, this is Flights and Passengers. Oh, okay, so, so I, if it's similar, it might do. Okay. Right, if it's similar. So Flights and Passengers, for example, you could get a – you know, say a used 737 for $50 million. A new one was a hundred million, but the hundred million dollar new one required less maintenance and upkeep in the initial phases. Now, uh, and, you've also been doing sim coders economy. Correct. And is that only for GA or sim coders? Uh, that only works with the rep aircraft, right? The reality expansion packs. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's with the reps. And then the account is shared between them. So if you have the rep for, I know you've got the PC-12, but you don't have the rep, the Carinado. Correct. So if you had 
that and then I have the default Baron and then we both have the default 172 for you to fly any of those three airplanes the money you would earn would go into the same pot and it would come out of the same pot as well so if you <laughs> like I uh, screwed up a start on my Thrand uh, Kodiak all right yeah I think it was um it was like four or five hundred thousand dollars in damage I did to the PT6 so I had to reset it again Oh, okay. Incorrect start procedure. So, uh, I just trolling the forums because we hang out on the X-Plane forums and Facebook and try and answer questions and throw people our videos when it answers their questions. But uh, someone recently, and I don't think they meant it to be clickbait, <laughs> but they posted something like, you know, is anyone else getting bored with the sim? Now, they got pounced because... Yeah, Obviously, I read that one. <laughs> no one was getting bored except them. But I've been there, right? Have you ever, you ever had sure. those days? Where you get on the sim, and you're like, and, and it, it's silly when you think about it. You're, you have literally the entire world minus Antarctica. And we we'll, can talk about that later. And all of these multi million dollar aircraft from the history of aviation, and to mm -hmm. sit there and be like, I'm bored. It, it just means that you just need it inspired. And so sure. I kind of feel like. These sorts of things help to give that inspiration or that the gamifying thing where it just, you know, it's not just, well, I went and I flew to Milwaukee. Oh, no, I was taking this load to Milwaukee and it upped my account. And then tomorrow I'm going to upgrade this aircraft and I'm going to yeah. repair that one. And, that, and so, like, it really adds a whole dynamic. Uh, I got a question for you. I seem to remember FS passengers raided your landings. Well, and, and that's another thing. And I, I really have, I don't know if it's good or bad. I have high expectations for air hauler. I, I can't remember the company that did FS packs, but that, yeah, it, it did. It measures your fuel economy. It measures your landing rate. It, it basically does all the, the nerdy geeky stuff that we do and talk about, you know, it does that all within the program. So do you feel like in a way it will help give that accountability thing that makes you you know, because you can fly as sloppy as you want. It's X plane. Who cares? But yeah, it's more fun if you actually discipline yourself because there's sure. more things. And so this could maybe help add that discipline if you know. Hey, if I plunk, the, I should go around because I just smash this landing. Well, and and that was the thing. I, I flew flights and passengers. Yet you could set a fail rate on there, and I think I flew it at about ninety percent. So about one in ten flights, I would have something. I had. Um, engine failures i had gear not down and locked i had and i was running that at the same time as i was flying for uh flying tigers group our old va right and so i was running that and flights and passengers docked you if you broke the 250 knots below ten thousand. Oh, you know, i remember docked, yeah. yeah it was just little things like that so it really combined the va experience and of course, you had the byproduct of getting revenue because I used to fly for Cathay Pacific Virtual when I first flew for uh, Flying Tigers. And um, I was all the time between, I think it was Manila and uh, Hong Kong, you know, because it was like a two and a half or three hour flight, 747, right, right, man. Right, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could just sit there and, and beat it up. Cathay 901, Cathay 902, I think, were um, either 900, 901, or... Uh, 901 and 902 were the flights I flew all the time. But yeah, just going back and forth and you'd rack up that money. You know, you could, you'd serve passengers food. You know, they're, they would rate your airline higher, a higher rating on your airline got you more customers for the next flight. So I'm really hoping that's what air roll air hauler two does. And they say you can expand it to an online VA where other pilots can fly passenger routes which would be perfect for you and i because we're already yeah. uh sharing airframes through project fly but it yeah. doesn't do anything other than accumulate uh log hours for the aircraft exactly so so a little a little virtual company and a virtual airline i mean this kind of it pegs the geek meter you know if all this works so well so like i said uh sorry. Well, I was I was just I was looking down our list of topics and thinking the next mm -hmm. thing actually when right. it's released ties in perfectly to air hauler if it's uh if it's what we're thinking it will be. It does. Um 
so so what were your thoughts looking at these preview images of the SSG 747-800 freighter variant? Well, I mean, it it, it looked like a freighter. Uh, you know, it looked like a 748 freighter. Uh, it, you're well aware that the SSG uh, 748-V2 has had a lot of mixed criticism. Of course, I had the original one and uh, purchased the uh, V2 as well. I'm looking forward to it. There was one image, and I'm trying to pull it up here and look at it. Uh, guys, again, these links will be below if you're not familiar with them um, or you want to see them. But, I mean, look at the, the crew rest area there, Tim. Mm -hmm. I don't know if yep, you have I'm it out. Yeah, I'm on it right now. You've got the ladder inside the door that goes to the flight deck. And look at the tail stand, that third picture down, you know, for loading the aircraft and unloading it. Yeah, no, that's uh, a nice little addition. I wonder if that's one of those ground equipment things you'll – turn on and off with the menu quite possibly yeah um, and, and, of, and of course they animated the cargo door uh and both the nose and the uh the aft main now, cargo door I, I i picked up on something here i want to know what you think sure in the nose shot uh, for people who are checking this out it's only about what one two three four there's five images images four and five are mm -hmm. the uh nose cargo door open as well as one of the aft uh, port side doors open. I guess there aren't any starboard side doors, so that's, that's not a thing. Um, in the nose cone, there's secured cargo shown, and in the uh, aft port side door, it's empty, and you can see all the beautiful floor rollers. So here's my question for you. Do you think they're going to do um, a thing where you can turn on and off the cargo so you can like see cargo or you can see it empty it's possible because that because i was just looking at these what? images i was like one image shows cargo the other does not i wonder if it's going to be optional well and another thing if they did it like uh if you remember thranda the kodiak as you increase weight it increased virtual cargo when you had the cargo that would um, variant be the coolest thing Something like that would be cool. And you know what? It's possible we may reach out and ask this very question to the guys. I mean, you know, they've been very uh, helpful with us and shared information with us in the past. They're uh, Steve Keller, I think, is the uh, – yeah, Steve Keller is the main guy, I think, over there that does a lot of the work here on the on the forum. Mm -hmm. And – No, they've been great to work with. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. uh, the most of the <laughs> – okay, of the complaints that we read – the ones that we felt held some water were complaints about the FMC. Um, and for people, uh, there were some people who complained about frame rates and it did look like it was a little more uh, frame greedy than some other aircraft. But, sure. you know, it's what, five times the size of most of the aircraft right. were flying. So I, I figured yeah. that much texture kind of is going to need a little more horsepower. So, yeah, uh I mean, it's almost got as many control surfaces on both wings as, you know, 737 has. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is In, an amazing. In its entirety. <laughs> and then uh, they have done some updates, mm -hmm. and uh, just from reading from other people, I, uh, mm -hmm. I think there's a decent number of people who have felt that they're doing a good job with the updates, trying to sure. fix the complaints people have had, and so... I, I never understood the people who were just out the gate, like, oh, it's trash, don't even get... And, like... They're like hard pass. Hard pass under what? You're going to go fly the default? I mean. Right. Because if you think this did, is crap, um, the default's absolute garbage by comparison. This is way better than the default. And did you ever check after we remapped your drive there on the air act cycles? Uh, Remember how you were having the SID and star issues? Right. They weren't, they weren't populating, but yeah. uh, I think that was a user error on my part. However, right. however, however, now, uh, yeah. we were having this conversation yesterday. I'm not claiming I'm a genius of flight sim. I just flight sim a lot. But you, sure. you have to make this assumption. I probably flight sim more and have almost, I can almost guarantee I have flown a wider variety of sim aircraft than their average customer. So if the install process was not clear to me, sure, then you can be pretty sure most people are going to have some issues with it. Yeah, and it uh, might be something to address. And I remember from the V1, I I dug in there. It was in there, you know, uh, in the manual, mm -hmm. but it was not one of those immediately apparent. I was kind of like, huh, 
that's weird. Why is that there? But um, hey, I- anyway, on that note, kind of back to where we were talking about them, mm-hmm. I did throw a uh, little question up there because if you remember when V2 launched, it had the SSG house livery and Lufthansa. Yep. So um, I asked if they were going to have release liveries or if they were going to trickle out through the Facebook and, and X plane. And they said there will be some freighter release liveries and more will be posted um, on, on the yeah. uh, xplane.org. That's right. They have that. I don't know if it's somebody who works for them, but there's one specific developer who's just a machine pounding out liveries for the uh, 748 Intercontinental. Yeah. And as you're well aware, I mean, we, we saw it that uh, one of them had their computer take a dump like week or what a week or two before release. That was kind of why uh, I, I believe there was only the two liveries available at launch. Yeah. But I mean, it's fine. They caught up, uh, you know, it's really not, it really wasn't a big deal because other than Lufthansa, like pretty much nobody was actually Korean. Korean, there you go. So we got like two main customers who were actually flying it. So it wasn't from a realism standpoint, wasn't really hurting you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And on the same note, um, just today, as a matter of fact, this morning, I saw that they had put up, they had the um, the next link down there, Tim, and it'll be probably the third or fourth one down is uh, beta. You know, they've got the beta testing going for it. So mm. they had some uh well i guess maybe like one action a couple action shots there but anyway you can take a look at it it's airborne well i think i'm ready to see what's next on this list sir are you ready for uh to go from the big long haulers to the small opposite direction (laughs) to the world of ga Yeah. yeah let's do that so of course the uh the guys guys and gals over at afm and torque sim have their sr22 coming out very soon uh, they released update six for the development program. It's available on their website, and that'll be below. Uh, I linked the index, and if you scroll down at the bottom, it has each of the individual project updates. Um, we're specifically speaking about six, but uh, their SR22 is going to use the Garmin Perspective Avionics. So that's the that's the really nice suite. That's the modern. So. All right. I, I don't know how far that's moved on from the G1000, but, uh, and I don't know the relationship with them and real sim gear, but they have an entire, I don't know if you clicked on that link, Tim, an entire Cirrus G1000 perspective console. Ooh. Nice. And it's like three grand, I think. Oh, 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 wait, wait. You mean like a desktop? It, yeah, you know how people are like, building their own cockpits? Like, oh, this is oh, so it's this is your hard. MFD. Yeah, it's your MFD, your PFD, your uh, all your buttons for your autopilot panel. It's a beautiful setup. Uh, they also do sell the, uh, if you open that link down at the bottom, they've got the 430s and 530s Okay, for well, your sim gear. I'm checking out that uh, development update on the G1000 perspective system, and... Uh, yeah, it's looking good, looking good. Yeah. You know, sorry, go ahead. Do you, are you a fan of G one thousand? Like, uh, do, I, uh, let me let me guess. Sorry, let me define this comparison more. Yeah, yeah. Steam gauges and a Garmin, normal like four thirty, five thirty, or a G one thousand. Which one do you prefer? Um, generally for me, when I fly the general aviation, I fly the steam gauge because of the higher capabilities of the big stuff so it kind of creates that broader dynamic between the two however um you know we've done several videos with the g1000 you know with the cirrus um what is it (laughs) it's escaping me now the Uh, sf50 yeah the sf50 right so i enjoy flying the g1000s when i do however i do it so infrequently that um I'm not super proficient on it. I, I think I forgot the um, I was flying the DA62 from Aerobasque not long ago, and I finally found out where the button was to make the vertical speed go up and down. I was looking for a knob, but I think on there it's a button in the center. Yeah, it's. I guess maybe if I actually flew a G1000 aircraft for a consecutive number of flights, I should add that to my to-do list. I, I might Ooh. appreciate it, but... Um, 
I have trouble at the moment when I get in a G1000 because the data presentation, you know, it's all there, but there's in some ways more information and uh, the, the, the geography is different than the panel. Sure. And the fact right, yeah. that uh, it's menus and screens and you can hide things and move things, you know, your steam gauge didn't move. It's, it's always right there. Might not always work, but you know where it is. So right. uh, at a scan, it's easier to scan the steam gauges. And since we're in sim, I can, I can pretty much guarantee my steam gauges won't fail if I don't want them to. True. Yeah. Well, and on, uh, and on that topic, if you remember too, the Thranda Kodiak, again, coming back to that, that had the synthetic vision in it. So the synthetic vision on the G1000 is pretty cool. Yeah, that's something I got to play with. I haven't gotten a chance to try that. Well, uh, so I, I left oh, our yeah. topic list. What else we got going on here? Well, I was going to say we have reached out to uh, Torque Sim. I guess we could share that, right? And um, we're we're hoping that we can get our hands on an SR22 at some point and uh, be able to bring that to you guys as well. Um. Yeah, no, no, that's great. Uh, for for those of you who've been with us for a while, we rarely get the opportunity to do this, but when we can, if we can catch a release date, we really love to get the first video out. Now, on one hand, it's awesome to get the views because you're the first video out. But on the other hand, we I think it's a need. I don't understand why developers don't guarantee that they have content creators who have videos ready to go on release day. And here's why. When you want to buy an aircraft, do you want to drop 50 to $75 on a payware with nothing to look at but the publisher's own commercials? You're like, uh, of course it sure. looks great in their commercials. You know, I want to see I want to see a YouTuber who I have some awareness of, who I'm used to seeing them fly. I know what they think. I know what they like. Uh, and, and yeah. get their honest vibe on it. And so um, when we, we've gotten to do that about two or three times and it really gets a lot of views and people seem to appreciate it because it's, uh, it's the best way to window shop for uh, payware aircraft. Well, yeah, you and I did it when we uh, first got back on the X-Plane 11 train, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're itching. Like uh, you remember uh, it's the unicorn of X-Plane. The 707. Uh, I was out of town. There were trailers for its release, and like I was salivating at uh, oh, yeah. at purchasing it. I couldn't wait, and I bought it immediately once I could. And now it's not available anymore. So sorry, guys. If you want to see it, go watch it on the channel. But your videos are infamous now. But here's the crazy thing. You know the the videos they put out. They had a youtuber or some they had somebody make them videos and the videos were great and it looked just beautiful it, it came out it looked better in those videos than it was in reality does that make sense yeah i mean i still would have bought it but i felt a little disappointed that it didn't i mean the, the videos got my expectation really high <laughs> well, really I mean, high it's it's marketing, right? I mean, yeah. that's what that's what we want to do. Anytime you're selling a product, you want it to look and feel the absolute best that it can. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag. If you get a good, well, if you look at it from the other side, Tim, remember when we did that uh, that V2 video with SSG? You know, it was getting all the bad press, and we're like, it's not that bad, guys. We got some flack for it. SSG was getting <laughs> way more again than we felt they deserved. Yeah, it's, and it's very interesting. Uh, so it can work either way. Yeah, no, that that's true. Uh, but that said, on release day, I'd be you know before you release it, yeah, maybe you don't want to risk people not liking it. But by release day, the cat's out of the bag, and if you don't, if you don't put it in the hands of simmers and content creators who are going to um, give it a fair shake then the internet is very quickly going to be populated with the uh, the people who can't get it to run on their $200 laptop from a decade ago. And, the, right. you know, just, 
I get it. Flight sim is difficult, and I'm not knocking people who are because I was that guy with that old garbage laptop, literally yeah, on ice blocks. Crap. I mean, I know, right. I feel the pain, but then you can't go out and crap on the product and be like it's trash because it doesn't work on my dinosaur. Like, nah, <laughs> that's not the problem. Right. Well, and that's something you and I've always tried to balance too, because we we are we are consumers. We've been fortunate enough in the past year and a half of YouTube creation to. Um, get some developers helping us out with their products as well so that's greatly appreciated but you you don't want to be in somebody's pocket so hopefully at least we're able to go far enough into those details to go yeah this is this way but this is this way you know and just objectively look at a product that's kind of our hope right and i you know that's certainly we go for it and to be honest the developers We've never even had one ask us something like, you know, they'll point out like, oh, we're really proud of these features. Make sure, or, or this one's yeah. a little less obvious, you know, people would have to fly it for a week before they notice. Could you, could you mention those? But no one's ever been asked us to gloss over an issue or so that's, uh, and I, I mean, they don't have to sway anyway. Very, very rarely have, uh, you know, we've gotten a few, um, aircraft from developers but it's usually after the fact uh, for, for those of you who didn't think about it since there's two of us um if it's a joint video we have to acquire two copies of the aircraft so that's twice the price so sometimes just to save our resources one of us will buy the aircraft make the video usually whoever's geeking out the most about that aircraft mm -hmm. and then uh after that we, we made contact with developers and sometimes they'll give us a copy for the uh for the other flight bro to uh to use sure sure well so well, speaking yeah, sorry go ahead. i think we're thinking the same thing you take it okay. away okay yeah i was gonna say speaking of developers uh fly j sim has posted up there that they're gonna change the way they do some support so if you have any of their products which i believe between the two of us tim we have uh all three of the ones currently on market i love fly j sim yeah uh good stuff over there and they are standing up a website, support.flyjsim.com. So they're going to be handling all of their uh, issues through there, um, kind of streamlined the product flow. Question for you, Lee. Have you ever yeah. had a technical issue with the FlyJSim product? Because you, uh, you have two, and I have two, although one of mine is... Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's just tell them what we have real quick. We yeah, both yeah. have the 727. Correct. I also recently bought their 737-200, the classic. And you yep. have that uh, older Dash 8. What do they call that? Yeah, the uh, Dash 8 Legacy now is what they call that. And the only problem I ever had, I think you were over here, and I think we may have been, I think we were doing kind of like a dry run for a live stream from my house. And... We flew the 727, I think FedEx, and it crashed like on departure. And I uh, think like like a program crashed, or we literally yeah. plunked the aircraft. No, 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 no. It was a program crash, okay. and I think what it was is it might have been a combination of weather and uh, the aircraft, and because I only had eight gig of RAM, I think at the time. Mm -hmm. So, but but it never repeated, so it was kind of a one-off issue, right? Okay, yeah, so it, it happened one time. That's why I don't. So yeah, we won't know, tag uh, that on them. Exactly. That so. was a good trip. Uh, we flew into Memphis at night, right? I remember that. Uh, no, no, that was when we did it at your house. Uh, ours, um, we were trying to go. I think Indianapolis to St. Louis, maybe over oh. at my house that night. But oh, we okay. went through all the pre-flight, and I think we made it to about five thousand feet, and then we suddenly just stopped flying for the rest of the night. Okay, I remember us doing a cargo at least once, and uh, because it, Orlando to Memphis, it's a good if you're if you're blessed enough to have somebody to flight sim with. A fly J sim aircraft is awesome to have a co pilot for, because the uh, slant alpha, uh, especially if you're gonna slant alpha, you can just throw in the FMC, but. You know the workload yeah, goes sure. up big time, and uh, with no mm -hmm. auto throttle, <laughs> you, yeah, somebody sure. needs to keep an eye on that. Um, so, so hey, this kind of actually ties into one of the. Um, this is not a like a news press release thing, but one of the things I've been screwing around with is uh, people keep 
commenting on the forum. I see this all the time. They know Fly J Sim's great. They want to buy a Fly J Sim. They're super excited. They cannot decide. 737 Classic or the 727. And so mm. I'm planning to do a video where I'm just going to compare. I'm not going to tell you which one to buy. I almost never tell you guys things like that. But I'll just tell you the things I love about the 737 Classic and the things I love about the 727. And then you'll probably arrive at the same conclusion I did. You need them both. <laughs> Well, there you go. That negates the point of a video. <laughs> We're going to do it. We're going to do it anyway. Because yeah. you know what? It's it's really cool. I think, uh, and Lee, because of this whole <laughs> pandemic, which is just spoiling all the fun in the world, uh, yeah. Lee hasn't been able to get over here to try out the 737 Classic. And That's true. Yeah. I'm in love with it. I haven't, for as much as I love it, I'm surprised I haven't been flying it every day. But it's... Uh, I've had another project I've been entertained with, so I'll get to that later. We, we still have one more uh, news news flash here. What's what's the yeah. last thing on there? Yeah, let's hit this final news release up here, and I think this was within the last couple of days as well. Torque Sims newly released Islander, which, uh, if you recall at the top of the show, we said was released during the last podcast about a month ago. Uh, they've issued uh, seven graphical improvements. Basically, it's an update. It's 1.0.1 is out. So if you have that aircraft, uh, go. I don't. I don't know how they do it. If they have their own, um, like Skunk Craft or an auto updater, or however you get your updates for that. But I summarized it there, Tim. You can see on our our notes as we move right, down. There's right, about right. seven, about seven graphical improvements and twenty bug fixes. So if you have that Islander and you like island hopping it or doing whatever, they've added some animations uh, in the cockpit, some lighting features. Now this is good because you know you can tell looking at this, it's only been a few weeks, mm -hmm. and this is very obviously the list of things uh, people have been sending in as bug reports, and right. so obviously they are staying on it, and that is good. Yep, for for sure. They even tweak so, their F mod. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. How about that? Well, look down at uh, further down there, Tim, on the uh, the second page there as we're looking at it. The headsets are twenty two or twenty percent too large. I'm not even sure what that means, but uh, I, I assume it means relative to the pilot's head. Yeah, so it, the, I, the circumference was. Yeah, <laughs> they look like they're in there with a pair of Beats audio or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, look two down below that. Static wicks should be black. So they really went through the details. On I this love one. Sibbers. You you know, it's probably. It's probably fun but aggravating to be the person who receives those uh, tech support emails. You know what I mean? Right. Like, hey, you know that's supposed to have five little static fingers on that one wick and you have four. Yeah, because on one hand you want to slap people. Like, are you serious? We've had people ask us, does it have X static wicks on one of the uh, – that might have been the SSG. And we're like, oh, yeah, seriously? Yeah. But then, I think he was being funny, though. <laughs> it's hard to say, though, because, you know, if you, if you really geek out and it's missing, or if you actually have time and type, mm -hmm. it's going to, like, just bug the crud out of you. So it's, um, it's good to see that, you know, they're staying true to their customers who are big geeks just like us. And, uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to start counting fan blades on the front of jet engines, make sure they're modeled correctly. It could almost be a game, <laughs> just like going through the high quality models. You can't do the cheap ones because they've got a million things wrong. But uh, yeah, go sure. through the high quality models and just like see who can find the most nitpicky, crazy little details. Right, right. All right. Well, I think that pretty much does it for the uh, industry news. How about we do some Flight Bros news? Uh, let's tell the people what we've been up to. All right. So for all 14 of you guys listening, Tim did a fantastic uh, Flight Geek Box video uh, unboxing. I guess those are kind of the thing on the Internet. So he did one of those. Thanks to the guys at FS Elite for sending both Tim and I our Flight Geek Box. Super cool. What would you think of yours, Tim? I think I'm actually kind of tempted to subscribe because on one hand, I'm like the last thing I need in my house is more crap and more airplane crap. But then on the other hand, I'm like, but I love airplane crap. <laughs> right. Like, I wonder what the next 
sticker or DVD is. Did you see on one of the boxes it actually had a die cast or, or maybe it was a plastic airplane in it? Yeah, no. Um, I looked back. I even saw that uh, you can buy previous boxes off Etsy. And then I closed. Oh, bad. I closed the window because I was like, I'm I'm going down a dark hole, and I will spend <laughs> money very soon. <laughs> like I want all the boxes. And the other problem is we actually kind of know the guy selling them now. So I, I kind sure. of, part of me wants to resist the urge to be really cheap and be like, hey, dude. <laughs> Wait, does does he actually, was he just distributing them on FS Elite's behalf or does he, is he involved in that company? Okay, so he's uh, a content creator, you know, just like us, but. I think that's a sideline he came up with. I think that's his own ideas. You know, nice. there's geek boxes for everything, but there's not sure. one for a uh, flight sim. Okay. And so I had seen the ad a long time ago and it looked cool, but you know, I was like, yeah, nah, I don't know. I was just waffling about it, but um, mm-hmm. no, I'm pretty sure he's making them at home And that's part of why it's bi-monthly. And, you know, the flight sim community has some size, but it's still kind of a small niche. It's going to take time. It seems like the sort of business you could run from home because. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And anyway, uh, yeah, I I liked it. No, I'm digging it. Actually, the only thing is, as I was clicking, I saw some of the pictures of the boxes. And I think some people got a Kai Tak video this month. And I was like, oh, I want that. <laughs> Ooh, I, I have one of those from, I'm trying to remember the publisher or whoever that made it. I think you've actually seen it before. It's like two or three hours of uh, Kai Talk <laughs> landings and takeoffs over like classical music. So yeah, we had the uh, the Flight Geek Box video. Also the Thranda Kodiak video. I put that up. Um, that seems uh, to be doing pretty well. I think people are really liking that video. Well, it, yeah, and you're kind of aware of this, but in our last little podcast thing, we hadn't we hadn't had a video in a while because of the uh, the pace with things going on at at home and work, and then the FS Elite stuff and whatever. Nobody cares. They only care about what comes out on the internet from us. But I was originally doing the S Tech Autopilot, which is in a lot of general and light aircraft. But I was even texting you, Tim, if you'll remember, and I couldn't get, like, heading mode work, the VS modes work, altitude hold. I could even get it into a landing configuration, but I couldn't get it to lock onto a VOR. And I text you, and I ended up trying three different aircraft at three different airports in three different regions. Weird. And I couldn't get it to track. So... I kind of thought to myself, I was feeling deflated because I'd been working on it off and on for about two weeks. Right, right. And I said, man, I, I was like, I need a win here. And um, it was just, I'm like, how hard is this to not lock onto a VOR radial? Why? I still haven't answered that question. But then I'm like, you know what? I haven't done a video on the, the Thranda since I bought it. I don't know, probably three or four months ago now. So I just did a quick burn on that. And uh, yeah, I, That's I, I, great. I had nine. Nine and a half hours is what I spent on that video. I wanted to buy it by the time I watched it. I was really taken with it, and uh, we've we've never flown in the Kodiak, but we have been through a Kodiak and seen yeah. one fly before, and uh, that's a, it's it's an impressive aircraft, and it's kind of a specialty niche aircraft. You know, it's it's yeah. ve- it's very optimized for a certain category of jobs. Yeah, it's like a, it's a caravan. F- functionally, it's kind of the s- similar market of a caravan, low passenger count, you know, or a mm-hmm. utility type, you know, unimproved area. So, well, where we saw the uh, real one was uh, missionary services, but you right. know, you know, a lot of uh, missionary work actually involves uh, hospital type work and air transport work and cargo work. It's really uh you know, it was for a missionary group, but their operations were actually more of a crossover of um, <laughs> airline, cargo, and ambulance. Right, like all of it. Yeah, because uh, the places they're going are so remote. Like, that's it. They are the connection to the outside world. Yeah, sure. 
Alrighty, well, I've got a few pans in the fire. I mentioned this last video, and I actually, I'm making progress on it, but I'm still working on that uh, Tupolev to 154 video, and I have <laughs> finally decided, gosh, it's been two years, and I'm finally going to do it. I'm going to break a video into chapters, because um, it's just a beast. It's a huge... If you've never seen this Tupolev or how it works, um, it's a love-hate out there. Actually, I haven't seen anyone who hates it, but I could understand why you might. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, people who talk about it, everyone talks about it kind of like climbing at Everest. Oh, have you flown the Tupolev? Oh, I'd love to see a video on the Tupolev. You know, like we did a video on the 727, a full cold and dark annotated great tutorial if i say so myself right yeah good work <laughs> and i do <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh people comment oh great you should do the tupolev next and so that's actually part of why i got it i mean i was curious i like all the soviet uh era hardware anyway sure, yeah and then what i realized every system is discreetly broken down so literally every function has its own switch Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, you have powered on the uh, environmental system and a few of the pressures are automatically regulated and this and that. Nope, nope. It's 100%. Everything is completely split up and you're going to get to activate it yourself. So it's a real beast. It, I mean, it wasn't that bad to fly. Honestly, I, I did two cold and darks and I kind of had it. But what is a beast is trying to put that all out into a video with the annotations the way I like to do them. So I uh, just bit off a little more than I could chew there, but you're going to get chapter one uh, before too long. Well, and I think you and I were talking about this not long ago that about the third or fourth time that you've flown an airplane, you start to, I think we've thrown the term around, feel sort of type rated. You, you learn where the indications are supposed to be, the button switches, all that stuff is. But I caught, uh, this is probably two, maybe April, March now, uh, Flight Deck to Sim. He flew the TU-154 in a live stream. Yeah, I got to go watch that. It's going to be a yeah. I was able to catch the first part of it. I think the stream actually broke into two. I think there was an issue with his stream. So he had, um, I don't know if it was the cold and dark, and then it reset. Like, by the time I joined the stream... I think he was taxiing, getting ready to take off, and he was already referring to, hey, guys, sorry about that. So, And yes, guys, if you're watching this, we do watch some of the other YouTube guys as well. We are we are Sim and Av geeks, and uh, yeah, we, we watch other people. Well, um, on the note of just Sim and Av geeks, I got this real bee in my bonnet to go to the caribbean be in your bonnet yeah you've never heard that expression i have not sir it's like ants in your pants you know i've always forget a ton of our audience is not americans and so the that might not be uh euphemisms they know either so whatever i got this real desire to fly through the caribbean and um i went down there oh i know what it was I wanted to go to Cayman Brack because I was playing, I branched out to something different. I was doing an old Rainbow Six uh, Raven Shield. It's like from 2004 or something. It's kind of older. And I, uh, one of the missions is in Cayman Brack. So I'm like, ah, I'm going to take the PC-12 from Key West down to Cayman Brack. And I had such a good time that I thought, okay, let's try... Let's try uh, going to another island. And then I'm like, hey, I'm getting a lot of flags in um, Project Fly. So I just started Caribbean island hopping. And then I started uh, reading about these islands. And, you know, because some of them are even split between countries on the same island. Just So it's just interesting history. But then uh, when I started throwing some of it on Instagram... I started finding mm -hmm. some actual pilots who were down there accumulating hours, literally flying PC-12s. And uh, I found this uh, one guy, I think he's French, and he's flying into St. Bart's a lot. And he's got a really good camera and does some photography work. Uh, just just geeking out, geeking out. And it looks beautiful. Is that where it was at? St. Bart's? 
Huh? St. Bart's. It's an island. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the one where you come over. Uh, the one approach has them kind of scooting their tush down a hillside to the runway. Yeah, and it ends like on a sandy beach. A lot of people overrun that. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, if you can't stop, if you don't touch down or stop in time, you're going to be in the lagoon. So it's uh, it's interesting. Um, it wasn't as hard as I I kind of got a little amped up to fly in there thinking, oh man, this is going to be, this is going to be rough, but it, it actually, it wasn't that bad. And I think probably because the PC 12 was really a very appropriate aircraft for the job. Sure. Maybe if I was like trying to take a biz jet in there, I might've been swimming, but no problem with the PC 12. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm most of the way through the, I'm about, now, two-thirds of the way through the Caribbean. I'm going to go the whole way down South America. Hey, didn't our buddy Merrick um, fly in there on Facebook? Didn't he fly a bunch of aircraft in there trying to land them? You know, I, him? I have not seen his posts lately, but uh, okay. I have seen plenty of occasional posts from other people flying ludicrous things into Caribbean islands. <laughs> well, sure, why not? It's either that or Lukla, right? Uh I actually did one. I, I think I was telling Lee about this. You know, uh, hanging out, doing flight bro stuff with Lee has made me a much more uh, disciplined sim pilot because I used to just kind of screw around and do all the things that should never be done in the real world. And I've largely curbed that habit because I'm having fun trying to do things a little more realistically. But that said, I was in the Caribbean with the PC-12, and I uh, needed to get out the legacy and re-familiarize myself with it. So I flew to, uh, is it Saba or Sata? I think it's Saba Island. Is it Saba? Saba. Uh, it depends how you want to pronounce your A. Yeah, yeah, I think I heard one of the guys at work say Saba, but I don't know if that's how it's pronounced. Well, the, well, the ICAO is uh, TNCS, Tango November, Charlie Sierra, and... Um, just Google it, guys. Saba, Saba, however you want to say it. Um, mm-hmm. It's not a place you should take <laughs> the Embraer. But I did get the legacy down, and I I slightly overran the runway, slightly. But I did not end up crashing the plane. Um, well, that's good. Although, when you look at real-world pictures... It mm-hmm. looks like I probably should have gone down a cliff. It, it actually should have been the end of that aircraft and probably my life. But, you know, yeah. whatever. I haven't done a just ridiculous messing around in a while. So, yeah, I did that. All right, Lee, I have a question for you. Well, this, yeah. is, this is my last goofy thing I've been screwing around with in uh, x okay. Uh I mentioned Project Fly. I'm trying to get some flags. Needed an Antarctica mm-hmm. flag. So yep. lo and behold, you know, we've been flying X-Plane hardcore for two plus years now. Did you even know Antarct- Antarctica is not there? Uh, you, Yeah, well, you and I were having this discussion, and I remember we flew down to one location, but I'm going to let you kind of handle this because I haven't messed with it. Yeah, so I, I went and spawned where we flew. So there's at least two airports that are there, quote unquote, in default scenery. But they're there kind of like an aircraft carrier is there, just in the midst of an endless sea. So all of the land mass and the ice is completely not there. Now, granted, it's obviously not bothered me for two years, but I was a little disappointed. And I'm like, well, I want an Antarctica flag. So um, so long story short, I found uh, two scenery packs for uh, specific airports and they are your closest airports to South America. That would be S-A-W-B. I think that's uh, Marambio, which is an Antarctic base. And S-C-R-M, which is um, another base. And that one's named for a person. And I'm not going to butcher their name right now. Mm-hmm. But uh, I downloaded just the airport sceneries. And they looked even worse than the default uh, being <laughs> aircraft oh, really? carriers well the scenery was great the problem was you couldn't overlay it over nothing it had to have antarctica so oh, right. i went and got uh on the aerosoft forums i found uh, antarctica xp part one and i just downloaded the the chunk of antarctica i needed mm-hmm. and uh oh man it looks good and the weather's well, maybe- terrible 
Maybe Antarctica is not there because of global warming. <laughs> it, it's it's so <laughs> hot. It melted the ice and the land. It's just a volcanic waste. No, right. Uh, but uh, that that's I was just texting Lee just the other day. I was like, hey, I flew to Antarctica. Uh, cloud bases were at 700 and the uh, the minimum decision altitude for the airport was 740. <laughs> Cross Land. winds was uh, 26, <laughs> gusting 36, and the max uh, crosswind component for the aircraft I was in, the King Air C90, is 24 knots. So of course I did it anyway. Yeah, that sounds like a sounds like a continue to me. Did you see it on Instagram? I I did actually. I wanted to ask you that. Speaking of Instagram, what was the airport or the location where you were taxiing the PC12 through the little? tree taxiway was oh. that like a fly-in community uh that's punta cana in uh is that dominican republic oh okay, okay. Go, go look at the comments because somebody asked me and then i had to go look it up because i had island hopped so many islands i was like uh oh, that's a good question i actually had to like look at the day i made the file look at my right. logbook and find the airport like i just uh, i was flying over and stopped here no it was so weird because i yeah i turned off the runway and i was like i'm in the woods this is awesome. I couldn't explain it. I was so overjoyed to drive my plane through the woods. You'll notice I'm like never on the taxi line. And it's because I'm, I, I, I did <laughs> notice that a spirograph could have done a better job. <laughs> I, I was waiting for the internet to eat you for lunch about that. You know, oddly enough that, that's gotten uh, a lot of likes and likes from people who don't always like our IG. So it's a, uh, it struck a chord taxiways through the trees. It's yeah, very popular. Sure. Um, well, I want to go check it out. So I might take the uh, was it Airfoil Labs King Air down there. Yeah, no, I the Caribbean and X plane, even with the default airports, it's a blast. I'm having a great time. Uh, just one quick note because I ran into this going to Antarctica. Hmm. I should have watched your video in preparation because I took out the King Air, but I didn't. So, um, flying down there. I walked out of the room for a snack, was out for about 20 minutes during cruise, came back j just about the time I wanted to descend, literally sat down, start looking at my gauges, and right then, engine two, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking to myself, I, I don't think this is failures, because I think failures are off, so I did something wrong, and just as I'm having that thought, engine one, and, and I seem to remember, yeah, and I seem to remember there being a fuel thing. So I was able to mess with that fuel panel on the left, switch some cross feeds on. And uh, once I started getting fuel back into the nacelle tanks, I was able to restart. So maybe you can clear this up and we can toss a link to your quirks of the King Air. Do you remember what the deal is with the King Air's fuel system? Does it, does it feed from the nacelle tanks? So that, was not that video. I believe that was actually one of our friends that was watching during the live stream mm. when we tried flow, flying that up around Seattle. Um, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, don't but, watch that live stream. <laughs> yeah, well, you can watch it, but it's just like watching a, a yeah, slideshow. One, <laughs> one frame per two <laughs> minutes. There were That's serious awesome. internet no. issues that day. Yeah, the audio is fine. But um, that actually is the reason why we stopped live streaming. That, that was actually time. our first podcast. We just didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I believe that's what the uh, the commenter said was that it fed from – it feeds from the main tanks to the nacelle tanks. Right. Now and it's, then it's nacelle to engine or something like that. So here's what I found. In the uh, X-Plane documentation – it's not mm -hmm. on the checklist from Laminar, even though they right. made it. Uh, I downloaded a couple free checklists for it just to get me going fast. Not in theirs. Mm -hmm. And even when I posted the pictures going to Antarctica on the X-Plane forum, I had a couple people jump on like, every time I fly this, the engine shut down. And a couple other people like, yeah, me too. And so I just told them what, what I did, and, you know, just go over there and flick on the cross feeds, uh, switch the fuel indicator to the nacelle tank and make sure you keep gas in the nacelle tanks uh, so. well yeah because there's a switch on there too right that uh it defaults to one position so when you click it it momentarily goes to the other and it gives you that fuel tank level 
right? There's total fuel and then there's nacelle fuel. It stays on total fuel, but the crazy right. thing is your engines don't fail because you ran out of total fuel. I mean, eventually it would, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 odd. It's odd. So there you go. New quirk for the King Air if you haven't already experienced it. Otherwise, it's great default aircraft. I had a lot of fun, and uh, it handled that crosswind like a beast. You can check it out on our Instagram. What are we? Flight FT twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen. Yeah. Flight, Flight FT twenty nineteen over there. Yeah, and I think our Instagram's pretty uh pretty banging. It's got some decent stuff on it. It's, you do really well with getting the little video clips up there. It's got I suck at that. So. Yeah. Right, yeah. If I actually, I haven't flown X plane in over, a little over a week now since. You naughty boy. Yeah, uh, yeah. I know. I know. That's because other games have infiltrated. Uh, should, should we mention that? I don't know if there's any Helleborn players out there. Oh yeah, yeah. Valid point. If any of you guys are still with us and you play Helleborn from Steam, um, yeah, you might find us out there. I'm. What am I? I'm Lee FBFT, right? Uh, right. I'm Retsec, R-E-T-S-E-K. Yeah, you, you should change that to FBF. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> FBFT but, uh, Tim. Well, yeah, if you guys, if you guys hop on there and want to blow some stuff up, it's all like a uh, helicopter based, kind of like uh, for third person shooter, capture the flag, domination type stuff like that. So yeah, and it's, I mean, it's not a sim. It's definitely a game, but For the sure. uh, graphics of the choppers are great. And I told <laughs> Lee and I were talking that the, the way you manipulate the aircraft, um, it, it's not the way you actually would fly one in real life, but the way the computer translates your inputs and makes the aircraft move actually has some very good look to it. Lee said sure. it moved. Uh, what'd you say? It, it, it flies real ugly, just like a real chopper. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because helicopters don't fly. They're so ugly, the earth repels them. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm not good at that game at all. So if you just need an easy win, you should just jump in on the opposing team because I'm still figuring out what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> well, most of the time we run the co-op too, you know. And and I had one cool thing. Uh, this was before you got on there, I think. I was flying with somebody, man, and I came over a hill. I was in a uh, CH-53 and I came over a hill and then made a turn for the landing zone, man. And my tail gunner and door gunner is just like lit up because there's no, there's no arm armament controlled by the pilot. Mm. So it's all run by the, uh, the system, right? So I come over there and there were some bad guys in the area. So they start lighting it up, and it was, it was pretty nice to see a 53 turn and kind of roll around there with three guns blazing. Nice, yeah. The the graphics on it are really good, and it's uh. At least what we're doing right now is all Vietnam era. And uh, it's just good times. If you dig that kind of thing, you would probably like yeah. it. It was a cheap game, right? Uh, it's yeah, like seven it's, bucks. It's, well, we got it on sale. They were they actually had it free a week ago to play for the weekend. And it was on sale for like seven or eight US dollars. Normal price on it's 20. And um, I don't think that's a bad price. No, it's not if terrible. You, but to compare yeah. seven or eight seems like highway robbery <laughs> oh yeah yeah but if you like helicopters and kind of blowing stuff up and the co-op mode and you can probably help me with this tim the, the co-op mode's really enjoyable i think yeah uh, in co-op mode uh the real players work together to complete missions uh against ai enemies and that's uh that's kind of fun we, we did a we did a co-op like team on team where it was real people versus real people and what was frustrating is um, it was almost too even, right? Like it was like World War One with helicopters. Like very little progress was being made. We played for half an hour, and mm -hmm. uh, so. But well, and we only had what three on three, and I had it set up to be an eight on eight, which is the maximum. God, that but, would be mayhem, mayhem. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> it's pretty intense, but. Uh, All right. Yeah, anyway, so. There you go. If you guys are looking for something to do, you might find us on Helleborn. Yeah, if you're wondering why Lee hasn't put out a video, Helleborn. <laughs> well, you know what? We should make a video of you and I on Helleborn. Oh, my goodness. I like that idea. All right. If you've listened to this whole video, A, congratulations. And uh, B, <laughs> drop us a comment if you actually would like to see. But I think I mean, we're going to probably do it anyway because that sounds great. Yeah, yeah probably because I think 10 
10, 10 people listened to our last quote podcast, and mm -hmm. there'll probably be eight to 10 more here. So we'll just do it. All right. Well, we're kind of out of topics, although we never run out of things to talk about, but we, sure. we want to keep this around an hour and we're right about there. So uh, once again, I'm Tim. And I'm Lee, the other part of Flight Brothers. So uh, as we always say, plan the flight. And fly the plan. <laughs>